Thank you very much. This is a tradition that um, I decided to continue. This is called Open Architecture Remarks. It's neither a nest nor an up band, nor is it a Locketron hack. But like these others, it is insanely hard to build a hardware, software, and application stack. It's been shipping for only seven months now with 600 games, XMBC, and more. Maybe you audience members should own one instead of a 3D printer or a PlayStation 4. <laughs> now, here's 20 minutes with Julie, entrepreneur extraordinaire, formerly a game superstar at IGN. You'll hear her Ouya story in four chapters and what she'd do if she could do it all over again. None of us were envious with Tony Fidel's story today or Hossein and Jawbone killing it at their later stage. But Tony Fidel, instead of doing a mundane household product next for Google, how about an Ouya to automate the home of Larry Page? Awesome. Okay, four chapters about Ouya. Chapter one, Kickstarter. It all started on Kickstarter. Show us a little bit of the video. Sure. I love video games, but more and more people are moving away from the television. There's a lot of focus today on the mobile and web platform. It's easier to develop games for those platforms. The television costs a lot of money. You have to work with established players in the space. And I've been trying to figure out how do we get them back to it. Ooh, yeah. Ouya is a new game console for the television that's built on Android, open source technology. It's an inexpensive game console for gamers. All the games are free to try. Anybody that wants to develop a game for a television, we allow them the ability to do this. I've been a so there Julie, we, we, do, we really just showed you that so you can see how good Julie looks <laughs> on uh, video. So what were, you, what, were you, what were your design goals with that video that works so well on Kickstarter? You might remind people uh, what happened in the first week on Kickstarter. Yeah, so Ouya is an open game console for the television. And when we came up with the idea, we really wanted to reinvent the way people develop content for the television and the way gamers interacted with it. Historically, game consoles were incredibly closed, and it was very difficult for independent game developers or even new game developers to bring their games to the number one screen in our lives, which is really the television. So we decided to build a hardware product with a game ecosystem and platform associated with it. Um, went up and down Silicon Valley and learned very early that hardware was a dirty word. That was about two years ago. Now things have changed. So we went to Kickstarter with the idea of first finding our community, making sure that people would actually want an open game console, and then hopefully raising the money that would be required to build it. So Eve Bahar has become kind of famous since you, uh, you first started working with him. How did you find Eve? Uh, probably and what, because, and what did he do? Yeah, I mean, Eve is an amazing designer. He'd worked in the game space on the DJ Hero, on interactive television with Peel, um, and that's sort of how I knew about him. I mean, when we first started, again, it was two years ago, I did, had no idea how to even build a hardware product, but we knew that if we wanted to bring another device into the living room, that it would have to be beautiful. It would have to be iconic, and it would, be happen it would have to be small enough that you could display it if it, you wanted to, but otherwise you could put it away. Um, and all of Eve's products did a really good job of mixing design with function. So asked around and got an intro. And was the cube form copied from the Apple building? You would have to ask Eve. It was actually his first design, and we fell in love with it right away. Did you ever consider a dongle? Briefly. This, this, is a, this uh, attached to your TV with an HDMI cable. Yeah, the problem with the dongle is, A, it's not iconic, and B, you can't really fall in love with the content of a dongle, because you can't fall in love with the dongle. Um, we wanted something that was iconic and unique. It had its own personality. Um, so no, we didn't go the dongle route. I also have never met someone who fell in love with a dongle, but <laughs> that would, it would be interesting to find the person uh, doing the rock and roll song about falling in love with a dongle. So for anybody who wants to do Kickstarter again, you raised, what, eight million and change in a couple weeks. It was a record at the time. Um, knowing what you know now, uh, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently about Kickstarter? I would beg Kickstarter to change their rules about when the product has to be delivered. 
nine or 12 months ahead of time, you have to put a date on the page. And when you're dealing with hardware, the one consistency is there will always be something you can't account for. And for us, it was shipping, so it delayed for some of our backers when they received their units. And so that was frustrating, disappointing people that believed in us uh, nine months earlier and gave us their money without knowing if we'd be able to pull it off. And I remember at the time, uh, there was fear with Kickstarter projects that not many of them had shipped, let alone shipped on time. So you kind of shipped day and date. We did. We began shipping in March, as we said. Um, yeah, Pebble and us, I think, I think when you're committed to something and you know that you're going to do it no matter what, you find a way. And we did. So chapter two was, uh, was first shipment. What was that like? It was amazing. Um, we shipped in... On June 25th, it was a little less than a year from the moment we actually announced the idea to the world. And one of the reasons we were able to bring Ouya to market so quickly is how we went about the hardware development. The fact that it's built on freely available components, it's using a mobile chip that's powerful enough to play great games. We launched um, both online and in physical retail in the US, Canada, and Europe. And uh, you know, when I first met you, you were only planning to sell on Ouya.tv. And by the time you launched, there was demand at retail. What are some of the lessons you learned about dealing with retailers? It's interesting. I mean, I think the other um, thing that we had talked about at the time was that we believed that 90% of our sales would come from Ouya.tv, and obviously then 10% would come from retail. And what we found out, it was really the opposite. Once you get the idea out there, people like to go where they want to go to buy the product. But to be successful at retail, you have to really support it from an awareness standpoint, a marketing standpoint, a trade standpoint. Um, so we've had our best months and we've spent money to make sure people know it exists. So Amazon versus GameStop, you know, Scylla and Charybdis, what's it like kind of dealing with each? The online retailers move much more quickly. Um, I think it's the benefit of them not having to hold physical product. They can speak more quickly to their audience. Um, with Amazon, you're used to buying products without the trial aspect, so it's just a different audience. And um, the box is also pretty iconic, you know, the, the black box that we didn't bring one, the free the games box. And, um, you know, how'd the box work for you? It's great. It's still a little too heavy and probably a little too big, which are things that you think about when you try to get it into retail. So you can maximize your shelf space. You can reduce the costs to ship the product. Um, but it's all in one. I mean, we wanted to make sure that when you took the game console home, you didn't need to buy anything else to play Ouya. So it comes with batteries for the controller, it comes with an HDMI cable for the television. Everything you need is in the box. And you had such a learning experience on the way to that first launch. I remember when you took the, uh, the long trip to China, working on supply chain. What's it like being a software chick dealing with Chinese supply chain? I think it's hard for anyone. In fact, I joke that it's not called hardware for no reason. Um, it's incredibly difficult to optimize the line, to continue to improve it, to figure out how you can get efficiencies out of the, the workers there, um, and continue to make a better product. I mean, one thing that is very different about Ouya, and part of it is how we developed the product, which was we didn't launch a perfect final product. In fact, if we wanted a perfect product, we may still not be launched today. By launching it on Kickstarter, we made a commitment to our community to include them in the development process. And we've been doing that ever since. So since June, we've had six software updates. We improved the firmware of the product. We recognize that the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth wasn't satisfactory to our gamers or even to ourselves. We've made drastic improvements on that because we continue to iterate them. So when you have this constant iterative cycle, um, you're making a lot of trips to China. And, and you promised Kickstarter um, supporters plastic. You ship metal, you know, plastic versus metal for uh, hardware. Talk about, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I kind of like metal in everything except games. <laughs> we, um, we did. I mean, the idea was a very big role of Ouya. Design was as important as, as the performance and the power of Ouya. So Eve designed a box that had aluminum around the console and aluminum faceplates. We shipped those um, for the Kickstarter backers and just learned the amount of um, complexity that aluminum caused. It caused the price of the product to go up for us, um, which we did not pass on to the consumers. Um, and there's a lot of tolerance issues between metal and plastic. So these are things that you should know and or learn throughout the process. And the next rev, we moved to plastic, and then we've also started thinking about really allowing consumers to personalize and customize it to their tastes and to their living room. So what you're saying, when it comes to hardware design, looks aren't everything? 
Looks aren't everything. And then how about you, you, uh, you launched with a pretty good suite of developer tools to try to make it almost instantaneous to get on Android. What did you learn about developer tools? Uh, documentation is key. So today, when we launched, we launched supporting one game engine, Unity, which is one of the most popular game engines for Android developers. And our goal is really to support gamers and developers equally. So part of what we've done, in addition to sort of working on the store and merchandising and curation, is to really work on the tools. So day one, we supported one engine. Today, we support north of 10 different engines with plugins and documentation. We've also made it so that our SDK as has as few differences from developing a regular Android game as possible to make it as easy for developers as possible to bring the game to the and television. And yet there's, uh, all the popular games are originals. There aren't any Android phone ports that are very meaningful. That's kind of a surprise. Yeah, I mean, when we started and we called it an Android game console, everyone thought, oh, we'll just bring the mobile games and they'll put it on the television and it'll look like shit because they're mobile games. And the reality is that didn't happen because they do. If the best games on the mobile devices or on seven inch screens are built to be used for touch, are built for 30 seconds to two minutes of use, um, are built for sort of that small sort of snacking of a game. But when you go to a television, you want to have a emotionally immersive experience. You want to have a controller that has precise, accurate controls. And therefore, those games just don't play on the television, which is why Angry Birds isn't the number one selling game on television. It's also why Call of Duty isn't the number one selling game on mobile. You, you have to adjust for the platform. You don't think there's a 15 second Call of Duty coming? It'd be like the shriek of duty. Yeah. So um, thinking back on launch, if you, uh, if you could turn back the clock and it's three months before your original launch, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think we would have held launch for a month or two. I mm. think once we got the product into the market, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth connectivity of the controllers really wasn't good enough for us. Um, and I think if we had more testing, we would have put out a better product. I mean, the good news is because of the way we developed OUYA, we were able to improve it and, and make it better and get it to a place that we felt comfortable with it. But um, it was a tough call, disappointing our backers or making the product better. And it was something we just didn't know because we didn't have enough testing. Take, take it from me, as an entrepreneur, you should never fear disappointing your investors. <laughs> OK, chapter three, Julie, getting ready for the holiday season. So uh, you're building up. Christmas is the big time. You've solved the wireless solution, and you actually did a uh, uh, price and configuration experiment for Christmas. Tell us yeah. about it. I mean, the benefit of the way that we've built OUYA, unlike traditional consoles which have seven or eight year life cycles, is that we have the ability to iterate quickly, even multiple times throughout a year if we wanted to, although I would never do that. Um, I'd never sleep. Um, so during the holidays, we actually launched an exclusive white SKU. We wanted to test color. It had 16 gigabytes of storage, so we wanted to test um, are people downloading a lot of games? Would there be benefit to greater storage? The result of that was a higher price point, and the, the test for us was a huge success. We sold out in under two weeks. Um, but it validated um, some ideas we had about the audience, about how many games they would download when they have a platform where all the games are free to try. And it also allowed developers to start building bigger games because there's more storage on the box. Because with Ouya, everything is downloaded and stored locally. Plus, the white looks kind of cool. It does look Never cool. underestimate the willingness of consumers to pay extra for unique. So um, what's been the role of killer apps? So today, we have 31,000 developers. We have over 600 apps. Um, 100 of them are exclusive. And the one that um, has really stood out is a game called Towerfall by Matt Thorson. Um, we found him back at PAX East June of last year. Um, it has been the most popular game on Ouya, and then he was just announced as one of the independent game developers that's launching in the new PS4 um, independent game channel. And I think that is a testament to our ability to find great talent, to find great games from up-and-coming developers, because they don't have the barriers and the hurdles of going to the traditional consoles, because they don't have the ability, or they don't have the financial resources, or they don't have the relationships. So uh, we are the Sundance Film Festival of games. We are the Sundance Film Festival. And, games. Um, and uh, tell me about analytics. What have you learned? So how many installs does an average OUYA owner uh, do per month, for example? Yeah, the first month is the heaviest. I mean, they'll download anywhere between seven and nine apps, um, or games, as we call them. Um, it'll continue. Wow, you call them games? That's we do call them games. In fact, apps are called games on our, our platform. Um, there's heavy usage, especially because everything is free to try. So the developer really determines how they want to monetize the content, whether it's 
pay to play or microtransactions. In fact, a large percentage of our games are actually donation based. Developers are incredibly altruistic um, and they build games because they love them. So a lot of games are uh, donate a dollar or five dollars if you love it. Um, how many of your customers are Europe? About 10 to 20 percent today. We just started shipping in Western Europe in Q4. So we're now in France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Poland, Benelux. So uh, chapter four, what's next for Julie and Ouya? So how are you, this is how you're solving um, both uh, customization and display. Talk. <laughs> well, chapter four is really 2014. I mean, we did all the development last year and kicked off the project tried to do a number of tests to learn about the audience, to learn about people's appetite for price, for customization, for personalization. We continue to iterate the platform. And this year is really about getting to scale. So we have found that um, people really want to try Ouya. And when they do, there's a greater propensity to purchase. And we see that when we go to events and we go to conferences and people have the ability to try it. So one of the things that we're doing with retail is creating kiosks so people can actually play the games. Because what makes Ouya unique is the fact that it's open. Um, that's the benefit. You can have 31,000 developers in six months and 100,000 after a year. But the challenge is, at least today, is you don't know what that one game is that you want to play that will cause you to buy Ouya. So having the ability for people to try it and to try things like Amazing Frog or Fists of Awesome, games that are unbelievably fun to play but you may not know of beforehand, um, is a huge benefit. So you'll start seeing kiosks and Target and in game in the UK. Um, we'll push, start pressing on customization more. We tested different, five different colors in the holiday season, and we hit our bare, low marker for we will actually and produce them. One of those, one of those uh, custom plates shipping. They'll start shipping in February. And uh, when's Soulfjord? So that's the next killer app on the horizon. Yeah, we, we worked a, with. We um, for that? Yeah, we worked with Kim Swift, who is the developer behind Portal and Left 4 Dead uh, from Airtight Games. They're making an exclusive game for Uya called Soulfjord, which is a combination of a music-based, uh, mythological RPG-type game. So that launches uh, the 28th of the month. It's the old music plus mythological RPG. Yes, RPG it's, the ki it's the killer uh, combination. I, I forgot to ask if you could turn back time and it were September 13 again, how would you plan Christmas differently? I would spend a lot more money on marketing. I mean, even though we um, were in retail at the same time, the traditional consoles lost, launched their next gen. Um, the little about, little bit about, little bit of money that we spent in trade, just supporting our retail partners, had a huge impact on sales. Now, people like it when they hear about it. Yes, they do, and they love it when they play it. And. Um so let's see, final thing about design. I believe all design has an organizational element. So talk about you've organized a founding team and you recruited some advisors. So uh, uh, as you entrepreneur away, you know, how do you build your team? I think you have to find ex experts that um, sort of impact every piece of your business. And we're unique because we really have three aspects of Ouya. We have the games ecosystem, we have um, the software stack, and then we have the hardware piece. So Yves Behar is our creative co-founder and designer. We partnered with Michael Marks, who is um, ex-CEO of Flextronics. Yourself from EA, who understands gamers and the marketing community. Um, Ed Fries, who launched Xbox. Um, as well as Brian Fargo, who's a developer. So as we think about products and we think about our strategy moving forward, we have an expert to bounce ideas off of. And I think that's critical for us because we are moving so quickly. So gamer community, here you come. Let, why don't uh, you want to wrap up with um, showing the new video you're about to put on the site? Yeah, this is just sort of who we are today. And the purpose of it is? Imagine you about if you could press a button and reset an entire industry. Yeah. What if the people developing the games got a system of their own that can reach millions of people in their living rooms? Now, the only thing between you, the developer, and a player is an on switch. 600 games and counting. 31,000 registered developers and growing. Available around the world. But we didn't create a revolution. We created a gateway to the independent gaming revolution. Rebel coders turning their labors of love into a living, or something like it. All available in one marketplace. The clever, the arcadey. The goofy. The meaningful, the mad. The one of a kind. 
the future. Oh yeah. Start pushing buttons. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. And audience, you'll be happy to know that my mic now works. Thank you.